Let's begin then. You can see, uh, I'm going to talk about the modernization of the Energy Charter Treaty. I think the, the, the name of the presentation hopefully says everything. Um, in order to understand this modernization process, uh, let's have a little look at the history here. Uh, let me introduce you to the ECT or Energy Charter Treaty. Um, it's a treaty covering trading of, of, of energy, uh, investments in, in assets that can produce energy, um, assets that through which energy can, can transit through, um, assets which distribute energy. Um, there are also measures on energy efficiency in there. I will not go into all of the clauses relating to um, the trade of energy, um, transit of energy, efficiency of energy, because honestly speaking, in comparison to the provisions on the investment, investment of, of, of products which produce energy, they are not so important. Because the Energy Charter Treaty is, is most important with respect to the, the provisions on energy, I, 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 I only think of it in my mind as an investment treaty. And as you probably know, an investment treaty is, is a very simple treaty where the contracting states promise to the investors of the other contracting states certain rights that they should enjoy when they have an investment in the original contracting state making these promises. Now, if the state hosting the investment does not live up to those promises, the investor has a right to go to arbitration. Speaking of arbitrations, I can move down to the third point on the slide there under the title, the mammoth. There have been, according to the official, the official statistics, 130 investment arbitrations initiated under the Energy Charter Treaty. The number I have heard unofficially is 150, um, but we know a minimum of 130. And why does that matter? Basically, it's because I mean, about 15% of all investor state arbitrations have been initiated under the Energy Charter Treaty, which makes it by far the most significant. The other reason why it's particularly significant is that it has 53 contracting parties signing up to it. So I mean, in terms of its scope, it's definitely the biggest and most important investment treaty. So when things start to happen to it, when it starts to be modernized, we need to pay attention. Can I move our eyes down to the next slide on the history of the Energy Charter Treaty, an extremely quick history, a one minute history of it. Um, I've decided to, to call it a, uh, a child of, of the revolutions. What revolutions, you ask? I'm talking about the revolutions overthrowing the, um, the communists in, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. So once this happened, uh, I, I think states in Western Europe saw their chance to create what they, what they called as the uh, European Energy Community with Eastern Europe. Of course, the idea was to bring Western capital, infuse it into Eastern energy supply, and hopefully there would be a, a constant uh, flow of energy from East to West. The problem was, however, <laughs> some, some years ago now, some big players pulled out. Um, I'm talking particularly about Russia and Italy. I mean, Russia, of course, is, is the big one because Russia is really a, an energy superpower. Now, some critics will look at this and say, you know, the, the reason for setting up the Energy Charter Treaty, you know, to bring Russia into the fold has now gone because Russia has left the Energy Charter Treaty. Therefore, there's, there's, there's no purpose to have this treaty anymore. Um, whether that's the case or not, honestly, I'm not interested in. I'm only mentioning these criticisms so you get an idea of the narrative that, that's building here because the critics also are saying, look, this energy charter treaty is going to be an obstacle to the energy transition because it's mainly protecting investments in fossil fuels. And the minute you try to take away the possibility of making money from those investments, there's going to be claims under the Energy Charter Treaty. And I think 
that the Energy Charter, which is the, the main administrative body for the Energy Charter Treaty, has listened to that narrative and said in the Book, um, Bucharest Declaration back in December of 2018, we need a modernised Energy Charter Treaty for New Realities, which is diplomatic speak for we recognise the fact that the Energy Charter Treaty needs to change because we need to transition our economies onto clean energy. Speaking of change, first legal question that we come directly into contact with. What are the legal mechanisms for amending the Energy Charter Treaty? Do we need all parties on board? Short answer, yes. Considering there are 53 of them, of course, that's going to be a difficult process. Um, what about the option of amending the Energy Charter Treaty into C or creating a new successive Energy Charter Treaty? So, so rather than creating Energy Charter Treaty version 2.0, could a certain collection of states come together and say, we are going to create a, a, an entirely new treaty? Well, this is a, a fairly involved question. I would say generally, yes, I cannot do justice to justifying that answer here. I more flag it at this point to say that if the negotiating or if the contracting parties do want to go down that route. They definitely do need to think about this, this issue. Um, can I leave it there and ask if you do have questions on the legalities for making a new energy charter treaty or amending it into C, then please raise them in the comments and questions section. This actually leads into the, to the next part quite well today. I seem to be suggesting that not all 53 states are on board in changing the Energy Charter Treaty in, in a certain way, and, and, and that's right. Um, I think the vast majority are open to change in one way or another. The, the main exception is actually Japan. Japan has said quite, you know, quite clearly, we like the Energy Charter Treaty as it is, and we definitely don't want it to stay. But I think most states are, are pretty open to the idea of, of change. However, we, we just don't know what the details are of what this new Energy Charter Treaty should be for them, except a couple of weeks ago, the European Commission, uh, very helpfully for my sake, released its draft proposal for a modernised ECT. And that's what we're going to look at here. So I'm going to bring you down to the next lecture slide. This is my, you know, the objective of my presentation here is to analyse some of the changes to the ECT proposed by the European Commission. Now, I want to make sure that I properly clarify the scope of my, of my presentation here. Um, I'll, be, I'll be focusing on the changes that the ECT, sorry, the, the European Commission has put forward. I'm not going to talk about, well, they could have done this and they could have done that because we'll be here all night otherwise. Um, the other thing I'll say is it's not a, an opportunity to go in and go bashing the, the, the European Commission. Um, I want to talk about what I think are some, some good changes and also some other changes which I think could be improved. The other point down there I have to mention is the politicking point. Um, this is definitely not a presentation where I'm going to put forward an argument with a particular conclusion in mind, uh, specifically that the ECT should be destroyed or, or maintained. Honestly, uh, what happens to it is, is not really my business. And it's not an implied criticism of those who, who, who are talking about the political aspect of this treaty, but rather it's just an enforcement of the fact that I think my main business is scholarship. Speaking of scholarship, the form of scholarship that we'll be doing is some legal analysis. So I'll be talking about one, the legal validity of some of the changes proposed and also talking about their potential meaning compared to what we have now in the Energy Charter Treaty. So. Speaking of that, let me go down to what I think is 
Well, it's probably the, the, the sexiest new addition, I think. Um, I won't read through all of it, but the first part of that text there says, we're talking about the Paris Agreement. And then if you read down to the last part of that provision, it says, each contracting state shall effectively implement the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement adopted thereunder, including its commitments with regard to its nationally determined contribution. Give you a minute to process that. And then I want to talk about this question, or these two questions, sorry. Does this provision give procedural teeth to the international obligations in the Paris Agreement? And my answer is potentially, because this provision, the EU has said it wants to make this provision subject to state to state arbitration. So in other words, at least on my reading of it, if we have a state which is a contracting party to the ECT and it does not effectively implement the Paris Agreement, then another state, which is also a contracting party to the ECT, can start arbitration against it. Now, what makes this important is that the Paris Agreement does not have any enforcement mechanisms for all of these substantive obligations it creates. And I, I mean, reading about the, the commentary on the Paris Agreement, this was one of the, the major shortcomings of it in, in some people's opinion. So the ECT might partially rectify this, but I mean, you, you don't want to jump out of your chair now and start celebrating if you read it the way I do, because the ECT has you know, around about, 50 states, imagine all of them join up to the, to the new modernised ECT. Most of them are already members of the European Union, meaning that they already have a lot of substantial obligations to tackle climate change. You know, we, uh, China and India, for example, Australia, um, well, was part of the Energy Charter Treaty. It's not really anymore. Some of these big polluters, the United States, are not part of the Energy Charter Treaty. So it's, it's not as revolutionary as, as perhaps it might look. The other reason I don't want to get too excited about this new provision is this question down here, the second one. Can the Paris Agreement be amended into C? Because that's really what's happening here. The, 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 the contracting parties to the Energy Charter Treaty are coming along and adding dispute resolution clauses, adding them on, bolting them on to the Paris Agreement. Is that possible under the Paris Agreement? Answer, yes. All right, first premise. We need to go to Article 41, Paragraph 1, Subparagraph A, of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. That's the governing provision in this case here. It says that modifications into C are permitted if the relevant treaty, in our case, the Paris Agreement allows for it. So the next question is, does the Paris Agreement allow for into C modification in respect of its dispute resolution clauses? Now, some of you will look at the Paris Agreement and say, well, there's not really any dispute resolution clauses in there. And you're right in a way. However, the Paris Agreement in Article 24 says that the dispute resolution clauses of the convention, the United Nations Convention, sorry, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change are imported into it. And if you check Article 14, paragraph number two of the convention, it allows parties to agree to arbitration of disputes under the convention, hence under the Paris Agreement. So the bottom line following this logic is that the Energy Charter Treaty is giving some procedural teeth to the obligations under the Paris Agreement. Can I move down to the next change that I want to focus on? 
This is the infamous standard on fair and equitable treatment. If you look at the vast majority of claims made by investors in investor state arbitration, they always say that the state has breached this particular obligation to provide fair and equitable treatment. The European Commission has tried to, you can see, further clarify that the content of this standard. I want to really focus on the second paragraph down there. When applying the above fair and equitable treatment obligation, a tribunal may take into account whether a contracting party made a specific representation to an investor to induce an investment, created a legitimate expectation which the investor relied on and that contracting party subsequently frustrated. So I'll give you a minute to take in that provision and then we'll talk about it. All right. Generally speaking, I think it's a, it's a good thing because if you look at some of the popular media going around about the standard on fair and equitable treatment, it looks like the bane of democracy because the idea is that you can use it to create international responsibility for states when one, the investor has an expectation of profit and two, the state causes a reduction of those expected profits. That's definitely not the way it works. The new provision in the Energy Charter Treaty makes that very explicit. The only questions I have relate to these words here. First, what does the meaning of may take into account? Um, you'll, I admit this is a, a small point, but I don't understand why when they're drafting these treaties, they don't make the language a little bit clearer and just say, look, if a state makes a representation, it creates legitimate expectations, and then the state frustrates those legitimate expectations, that equals a breach. It tells arbitral tribunals they may take this into account, which I kind of scratch my head and think, well, I'm, I'm not really sure what that means. Why wouldn't they take it into account? Could they think one day, well, we just, we just don't want to take it into account today. So I, I, I'd, I'd urge drafters of these treaties to, to use more simple language. Um, I am nitpicking here that the main point I want to talk about is the meaning of specific representation. Um, let me lavish a bit of praise or perhaps even criticism later on the European Commission uh, for this. So I think using these words is a step that it's a big step actually in the right direction for two reasons. First, it seemingly puts to bed the notion that an investor needs to get some type of written commitment from a state before it can start relying on what the state says to it. Now, unfortunately, in a number of recent investment arbitrations, the arbitral tribunals have indicated that's what you need as an investor. You need a very specific handwritten note or perhaps type note saying, investor, you have legitimate expectations to this in the future from the state. Now, the problem with that interpretation is that it, it turns the concept of frustration, uh, sorry, frustration of legitimate expectations into like a, something like a breach of a bilateral contract. And there's already a provision in the treaty for investors to hold estates to account when they breach bilateral contracts with them. So we don't need a second one. The second point I'd make is this. I'm not sure how many investors can get a written commitment from a state like this. If you are a small investor and you don't have the legal expertise to know that you should get that, or two, even if you do, you don't have the clout to walk into the Ministry of Energy and say, I'm here, I want a, a written confirmation about your representations to me. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I mean, I'm, 
I'm hopeful that we can move away from that, from that jurisprudence. Um, the second point I want to make, hopefully by using the word specific representation, it can force arbitral tribunals to understand that frustrating a person's legitimate expectations is wrongful on account of the fact that a person acts contrary to his or her representation. Now, this is going to take a little bit of explaining, and <laughs> once we get to the end of it, I, I think you'll be grateful. So what's happening is this. Arbitral tribunals have been saying what makes frustrating a person's or the investor's legitimate expectations wrongful is the fact that the person who has the legitimate expectations, the investor, actually believes that the person, the state, making the representation will perform on it. Now, that's a little bit of a complex theory, so let me you know, illustrate it with a fairly simple example. I'm on Zoom right now. I'm talking to approximately 40 to 50 of you. Let's imagine I say to you this. It's a very hot day, and later, after this presentation, I'm, I'm going to go to the Chiva Center, and I'm going to buy all of you a Magnum ice cream. That's a very specific representation. If I don't act on that representation, it's wrongful. I cannot go to you later and say, you know what, I'm a very, I'm a very unreliable person. In my constitution, it says that I'm very stingy, so therefore I don't spend a lot of money. You should have known, even though I made a very clear representation to you, I was not going to perform on it. That's essentially what arbitral tribunals are saying right now. They are saying, look, you know, the representation is one part. The more important question is, can we actually expect the state to perform? And when they have reasons to think that the state will not perform, they have been saying to investors, sorry, your legitimate expectations have not been frustrated. Now, hopefully, by, by clarifying it's all about the representation, we can move past that point. I realise that our time is, is coming to an end, so I need to get on to the last of my, my points that I want to talk about. I've called this one the rise of domestic authority. Um, this is a, an unnumbered article in the, in the EU draft right now. Um, I'll give you a minute to, to read through it. But basically, what, what, it, what you can see what it says is this. When the state has promised to give a subsidy out to an investor and later it needs to discontinue that subsidy or it needs to even like grab the subsidy back on account of its obligations as part of a regional economic integration organisation, i.e. the European Union, or it's been ordered by a competent court, administrative tribunal or other competent authority, that cannot equal a breach under part three. Part three of the treaty contains all of the investor rights or state obligations with respect to the treatment of investments. So what's the issue with this particular clause? Um, again, I, I won't, I won't labour on, on this, but the, the language shall not be construed as preventing. Uh, I, I think they could have chosen much clearer language, something to the effect of if, if the state orders the reimbursement of a subsidy, it does not amount to a breach. But anyway, let me, let me move past that point and, and go down into my notes and, and go down to the, to the second point here. Is this provision compatible with the law on international responsibility, particularly referring to the articles on state responsibility as produced by the International Law Commission. Now, yes, it is. Um, states are free to choose the content of their treaties. We have to accept that. So I don't question the, uh, sorry, the validity of the provision. But what I do note is that the integrity of the obligations that are found 
in part three, i.e. the obligations that states owe to investors, I think can be compromised by this provision. Because effectively what this clause allows a state to do is to say this, it can go to one of its courts and say, well, this, this, this subsidy that you investors have been receiving over the past three years, we just approached one of our local courts and it said, well, you know what, for example, under EU law, um, this subsidy amounted to state aid and therefore we, we should not have given it to you. We, we have to take it all back. Now that might sound fair to you, but the, the problem is, is that it breaches a fundamental rule in the law on international responsibility. If you have a look at Article 32 of the Articles on State Responsibility, it says very clearly, basically this, domestic law is irrelevant in determining whether a state is internationally responsible or not. And there's a very good reason for that because states of course could very easily manipulate their domestic law to make sure that they do not accrue international responsibility. And then of course, I go back to my original point, I'm concerned about the integrity of the obligations in part three. So let me finish up here with a couple of conclusions. Um, a welcome development in the indirect hardening of the obligations of the Paris Agreement. Um, good, well, good clarification on frustration of legitimate expectations. And finally, I think we can be concerned about you know, this rise of domestic authority potentially undermining the integrity of international adjudication. And with that, I'd like to finish and thank you very, very much for your attention.